Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for your patience. We had some minor technical issues, but they are happily resolved. Uh, I'm Zoe Eaton, the CEO of Defeat Diabetes. Um, hopefully you all know we are an online program developed by doctors such as the two that are with me today to help those with type 2 diabetes improve their health through simple changes to diet. Now, um, I'm joined for our special live event, thyroid and type 2 diabetes by two legendary figures in the field of low carb. First of all, Dr. Peter Bruckner, who is Defeat Diabetes founder and Defeat Diabetes expert, Dr. Paul Mason. Now, before I pass over to Peter and David, I also want to share some very exciting news. Um, if you didn't know already, the Defeat Diabetes program has always been available through your mobile app. Uh, but just last week, we actually launched the Defeat Diabetes program to be available on your desktop. So there is now a web-based version of the Defeat Diabetes program. You can um, access all of the lessons, the videos, the recipes, the meal plans uh, from the comfort of your PC now. So if you've been sitting on the fence about joining the program, now is the time. And if that wasn't enough, we also have a special offer for anyone that starts their trial before midnight on Tuesday, 18th of October. You'll receive a free, fresh and simple e-cookbook valued at $12.99. So don't delay after this webinar. Please head to defeatdiabetes.com.au to start your free trial and claim your free e-book. Now, I think we've kept you long enough. I will hand the reins over to Peter and Paul to go uh, through the webinar of thyroid and type 2 diabetes. Great. Thanks, Zoe. And once again, uh, apologies, everyone. Um, but uh, we're here now. That's, uh, so we'll, we won't waste any more time. Um, <clears throat> so um, what we want to do tonight is, uh, is basically just give you an overview of thyroid disease. Um, and uh, why are we, uh, are we doing that? Because it is very, very common. Uh, how common, Paul? Well, in actual fact, the second most commonly prescribed drug in the United States is actually a thyroid medication. And that's second only to uh, a cholesterol-lowering drug, a statin. So it's really common. It's uh, surprisingly, it seems to be one of these conditions of modern society, of modern lifestyle. And unfortunately, um, the drugs, they can help control some of the symptoms, but they don't control it perfectly. And fortunately, uh, there are some dietary options that actually do lead to improvement. Right. Well, I'm presuming that most of the people on the, who are listening uh, to this um, show are uh, have people who have thyroid problems themselves. I guess that's why, uh, why you're here. But... Notwithstanding that, I still think we should just go back to basics and then very briefly describe what the thyroid is, what it does, and how does it go wrong? Well, and I guess especially in the realm of type 2 diabetes as well, which is a metabolic disease where you get these high blood sugar levels and high triglyceride levels and increased risk of heart disease, at the end of the day, thyroid pathology manifestly makes that worse. For example, if we take one of the key symptoms of heart disease, a predictor of cardiac death, which is triglycerides, we know that an underactive thyroid leads to a, a significant increase in your serum triglycerides and the triglycerides in the blood. So what exactly is it? So when we talk about hormones, they're basically chemicals, signaling molecules that travel around your body in the blood. That's basically what a hormone is. It's it just something that circles around your body and when it gets to a target tissue, it does something, it activates something, it sends a signal, it triggers a response. And with the thyroid, it's very interesting because you can have both too much or too little. And unless it's in that Goldilocks zone, you're going to have problems. So the most common one is probably an underactive thyroid. And that's where people, because it regulates how well your body can burn energy, if you don't have enough thyroid hormone, you feel lethargic. You have this sense of lassitude. In effect, uh, you know, the, the power plants of your cell, the things that are meant to actually make you want to get up and move about, they're just working less effectively. So coincident with that, a lot of people will feel the cold. And that's because it's actually the metabolic activity of your body, which actually is like a little internal combustion stove. It's a heater. 
and if that's not working, then you'll just feel cold. So if you're, you know, feeling a lot of lethargy, feeling very fatigued, and you get cold very easily, then that can be a very good indication that your thyroid is underactive. On the other side of the coin, if you're overactive, imagine like, you know, you have a, a rush of adrenaline and somebody jumps out behind you and shouts boo or something like that. And you have that, oh, a, a bit scared. So uh, that's very similar to what happens when you have an overactive thyroid. It'll be uh, a sense of anxiety and the polar opposite of feeling cold. These people often feel hot. They'll often be very intolerant of uh, hot environments or even moderately warm environments. Um, but in actual fact, this sense of anxiety is is quite prominent and that's quite common. And I guess one of the things that we are going to talk about today is that our medical testing for thyroid disease is often inaccurate. It's not sensitive enough. And a lot of patients will have symptoms of thyroid disease that won't be detected on the testing. And that, that creates a bit of a problem. And the simple fact is there is a, uh, a, a medical phenomena called subclinical thyroid disease. It's well known. And these are people who, when they might go on thyroid medication or have their thyroid issues addressed, they feel a lot better. But for all intents and purposes, the standard medical testing does not identify them as having a problem. So we've got, uh, let's talk about the underactive thyroid to, to start with. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, you mentioned tiredness, uh, fatigue and feeling the cold. What, what are some other symptoms? Uh, what about uh, skin and hair and so on? What, what other symptoms you yeah. might have? From well, there, I guess, you know, patients come in, they feel symptoms. They usually complain about, doc, I just don't feel right. I feel tired. You know, I'm a bit irritable, you know, what have you. And you come into my office or if they come to a, a doctor like yourself, you'll have a look at them and uh, you'll pay attention to their eyebrow. Because if they've got thinning of the lateral third of the eyebrow, that's a textbook case of, okay, your thyroid's almost certainly underactive. Um, we can have a look at the skin. There's a lot of, you know, skin changes. Skin often becomes a bit thickened, a little bit scaly. Um, when the thyroid is underactive, it's just not turning over as well as, as, well as it ought. Um, one sign that, you know, obviously one thing that everybody knows about with the thyroid is this swelling because it's a little butterfly shaped gland on the neck that actually secretes this hormone and uh, if it's uh, in some situations it can actually grow excessively um, and that's called a goiter so if you see photos of people with this little bulb of swelling on the the front of their neck that's what we call a goiter and that's absolutely evidence of thyroid pathology um, but often it won't be so obvious and and but you can feel it. So your doctor, when they're examining your thyroid, will always put her hands up here and will ask you to swallow. And when you swallow, what that actually does is the thyroid gland moves up and down and we can feel the thyroid move up underneath our fingers and push it out, our fingers out of the way. So there's some of the physical things. One of the more common symptoms that people don't realise is it's got a fancy name. It's called pretibial myxedema. In English, it just means on the front of your shin bone, it's going to be a bit pudgy, a bit spongy, and it's going to be a bit sore to press. So if you run your fingers up and down the, the hard, flat surface of your shin bone and press in there and it feels a bit sore than it used to, then that too could be a sign that you've got thyroid disease. Not necessarily, but definitely <laughs> possible. Great. So we've got uh, this bunch of symptoms. Uh, someone comes to see you complaining of tiredness, uh, um, feeling the cold, uh, skin changes, eyebrow, whatever, and you suspect they might have uh, thyroid disease. So what tests are you going to do? And, and just take us through, in, in layman's terms, the, the sort of how you interpret those, uh, those tests, those blood tests. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, understand that you've got this gland in your neck that releases the hormone, it releases thyroid hormone. But there has to be a signal to that gland to tell it to release the hormone. And the body's got a, what we call a feedback loop. And if the body senses that you've got enough thyroid hormone, then obviously it won't tell the gland to release it. But if it thinks you don't have enough, it will send a very strong signal and it will say, come on, thyroid gland, pull your finger out. We've really got to, you know, I'm feeling a bit slack here. You know, you've got to up your game, release more thyroid hormone. And that signal 
is something that's called thyroid stimulating hormone. It's one of the very few things in medicine that actually has a logical name, thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, we abbreviate it as TSH. So almost certainly when you're chatting to it with your doctor, um, they won't say it in full. They'll just say, oh, I'm going to measure your TSH level. So that talks about thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, if you understand that when the body's sensing that it doesn't have enough thyroid hormone, it will increase the level of this, uh, this signal, signaling hormone, TSH. Now, if your thyroid gland, though, has gone on the blink and it's not working very well, then it doesn't matter how much TSH you can have. You can have it coming out your eyeballs. It's not going to be able to, it's flogging a dead horse. It's not going to be able to make the thyroid gland release more thyroid hormone if it's, if it's on the blink. So what you'll often end up with when the thyroid gland is underactive is you'll end up with a very high level or an elevated level of this TSH. And that's the first test that we actually do. The other test we do is that we can actually measure for thyroid hormone directly in the circulation. And thyroid hormone comes in two flavours. So it actually, it, basically, the, the number of iodine molecules, and people will be very aware that iodine is very important for the thyroid. So the number of iodine molecules that's on the hormone will depend whether it's a sort of precursor hormone or an active hormone. So when thyroid hormone gets released, it gets released into a, a four iodine version. We call it T4. And then one of them gets stripped away to turn into T3. And T3 is the one that does the job. That's, the, that's a really active one. So we can also measure those. And the reason we ought to measure those is because the TSH, while in general it's a very good theory, it's a little bit imprecise in actually diagnosing it. If we just rely on TSH, we actually miss a lot of people with actually an underactive thyroid gland. Uh, I'll give you an example. And well, actually, one other point I should make about this too is that you need to understand that the TSH going higher is actually an indication of a less active thyroid. That's a really common mistake because you would have heard, Peter, people say, oh, I went on a ketogenic diet or I read on the internet that the ketogenic diet makes the thyroid gland less active. No, the research clearly shows that going on a ketogenic diet on average increases the activity of the thyroid gland. And when it increases the activity of the thyroid gland, the TSH will actually go down. So that's probably one of the most common misconceptions about ketogenic diets and low-carb diets on thyroid. On average, thyroid activity significantly improves on ketogenic diets. But the problem is if we just rely on TSH, it's got a quite a broad range. So we say, well, if it's too high, then you could have a problem. The question is, where do we draw the line? Exactly how high is too high? So some of the laboratories in Australia will say, well, if it's over a level, and I'll use a unit of 4.5, 4.5, you could have a problem. But the thing is that these reference ranges are set based on 95% of the population. So, for example, 95% of the American population were shown to have a TSH level of below 4.12. So what does that mean? So that means that if, you're, if your level is 4.12, then you're about as bad as 95% of the general American population. And to be fair, this we don't want to be comparing ourselves against the general population. That's not optimal health. We've actually got very good data for pregnant females. The, uh, the, an endocrinological society recommends that for uh, having a good pregnancy that you should aim for a TSH of less than 2.5. And when we follow people up over time and we see you know, how likely it is that they're going to end up with you know, symptomatic thyroid disease in the future and these are the problems, we can see that the, the best prediction that your thyroid will remain healthy into the future is having a TSH of 2.0 or less. So you can appreciate that if we set a reference range at you know three and a half or four and a half, and in some cases even up to five, that we're missing a lot of cases of disease. So the first thing is that when your doctor's looking at the reference interval on the blood test and they're just saying, oh, your thyroid activity is fine, the fact is it might not always be. And you can also ask, well, is it perhaps I'm, I'm feeling pretty lousy 
is it worth testing my actual thyroid hormone? Remember the T3 and T4 levels. And uh, you, you can certainly measure that. And uh, if you're being shown to be deficient in there, then, you know, there, there may be some benefit from intervening. So let's say uh, you've got someone with the symptoms we talked about before of an underactive thyroid. Uh, you do the blood test. They come back with an elevated TSH and a reduced T3, for instance. Um, mm. And so you're pretty convinced that they've got an underactive thyroid. Okay. I, I, you've triangulated it. You've got a couple of different tests and you've got symptoms and they're all pointing at the same thing. I, I think that's a very, very reliable way. It's certainly in my practice. I would okay. consider that. So what's, what's the next step? What are you going to suggest to this, uh, to this patient with the underactive thyroid? Well, frequently, diet. When you go on a healthy diet, that makes a difference. But let's not focus on that for the moment. So we will come back to diet, and that is my go-to. But the question that's on everybody's lips, I'm sure, is about the drugs, is about the medications, is about levothyroxine, the number two drug being prescribed, hugely common. You see, this is what we call a synthetic drug. To, to be patented, drugs can't be exactly, the, or they ought not be exactly the same. There was a case where it has happened. We won't worry about that. But drugs ought not be exactly the same as what's in the body. So they have to change a molecule. So it broadly has the same effects, but it might be slightly different. So while your body will normally secrete T4, and it will then turn that into T3 and so on and so forth, when we actually give people thyroid hormone, in most cases, it's what we call a synthetic T4 levothyroxine or something similar. And some people, a lot of people do very well with that, and that's absolutely fine. Their symptoms of an underactive thyroid go away, um, no problems. But some people still continue to have what we call this subclinical thyroid underactive thyroid dysfunction, so subclinical thyroid dysfunction. And for those people, there's a certain subset who appear to benefit from what we call bio-identical thyroid supplementation. So that's often a mix of T3 and T4, sort of matching what the body more naturally will release. And it's also rather than having a bit of molecular um, mimic, you know, changes to make it patentable, it's actually identical to the version that's normally released by the body. So there is a group of people who will definitely benefit. And it's a bit difficult to identify. The research isn't that clear. There, To be fair, there hasn't been a hell of a lot of research done on it. Um, but certainly we do see that, you know, people say, look, when I have the levothyroxine, I don't feel so good. As soon as I go on the bioidentical, things pick up. Um, so, and that's all fair. So let's imagine that your thyroid gland has been completely destroyed, then medication is certainly an answer. But you can do a lot with diet before your thyroid gets to that state. So let me just explain what I mean. So this is going to bear with me because this gets a little bit in the weeds, but it's really important if you understand thyroid symptoms because some of you listening today will know that you've got a diagnosis of a thyroid problem, but it comes and it goes. You have these episodes of anxiety or these episodes of heat intolerance, episodes of maybe a bit of tremor. And this is all consistent with an autoimmune attack on your thyroid disease. So the way to think about it is in your thyroid gland, this little butterfly-shaped gland in your neck here, you've got these little silos that store the thyroid hormone. And if your immune system starts to attack your thyroid hormone, they burst open those silos and that thyroid hormone gets released into your circulation and it gets released en masse episodically. So you'll have this burst of where your body thinks, oh, we've got a lot of thyroid hormone. Oh, get agitated, all, all these, these business going on. And then the autoimmune attack, because autoimmune disease tends to be episodic. It comes and it goes. It happens in spurts or phases. And then it settles down and your symptoms will settle and then you might have another episode. So this is very early on in a disease, uh, similar to what we call Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where the immune system will actually attack your thyroid gland. But eventually, if you imagine that you destroy enough of these thyroid hormone silos, the thyroid gland will sort of shrink and it'll get so small that it eventually has trouble actually releasing any thyroid hormone at all, basically. 
So you'll go from these episodes of having spiking activities of thyroid overactivity to a chronic constant state of thyroid underactivity. It's still the same disease process. Your immune system is going to be attacking your thyroid, but over the, the course of the disease, over its lifetime, it has a very different manifestation. You'll go from these very overactive symptoms we talked about, which is a polar opposite of where you'll end up with the underactive symptoms. So the question is, well, what do we do about that? And modern medicine really does nothing. So in medical school, we were taught, so we can actually measure the immune system antibodies that destroy the thyroid gland in the blood. So there's two of them that we most commonly test for. One's called thyroglobulin antibody and one's called thyroid peroxidase antibody. And we can measure them. And I remember explicitly being taught in medical school that once you found somebody had an autoimmune disease against their thyroid because you tested these antibodies, to never test for it again. And I thought, that's a bit weird, but it had very good rationale. The rationale was there's no drug to fix it, so why would you bother? You, you know the patient's got the disease. All you need to do now is to measure the TSH and wait until the thyroid gland is completely destroyed and then somebody gets to go on a lifetime dose of thyroid hormone, which explains why a drug like levothyroxine is the second most commonly prescribed drug because once you're on it, you're on it for life. So it's a very good drug for, from a uh, commercial model. So then the quest. Yeah, go on. How, how, would a, how would a diet help then? Well, yeah, so that, that's the question. So then the question is, where does diet play into this? And we've actually found that in addition to low carbohydrates appearing to increase the effectiveness of thyroid hormone, so whatever thyroid hormone you have in your circulation appears to work better on a low carb diet, two foods actually appear to provoke this autoimmune disease. So they did a pilot study of a randomized control trial um, a few years ago now, where they took females with known thyroid disease, Hashimoto's disease. So we detected these antibodies in their blood, the thyroglobulin and the thyroid peroxidase antibodies that was circulating in the blood and attacking the thyroid gland. And they randomised them to two diets. One was the normal diet, just keep eating what you please. And the other group was to go on a gluten-free diet. So gluten, uh, you'll remember, is that kind of thing that we ask celiacs to avoid. It's contained in barley, rye and wheat. And it won't surprise you to know that the people with celiac disease have a vastly increased risk of Hashimoto's thyroid disease and vice versa goes both ways so they put these people on a gluten-free diet and then they followed up both groups and they were randomized which means that you know, all these confounding factors were controlled so the only difference between them if there was a difference would be caused by their dietary intervention and they found that in the group that continued their normal diet as i was taught in medical school these thyroid antibodies just kept on increasing and increasing and increasing predictable but in the group on the gluten-free diet over a six-month period, their thyroid antibody levels on average significantly dropped. And this, in my, my, in my knowledge, is the first clear piece of evidence that we can actually intervene with the background pathology of a lot of thyroid disease. Now, it's not all thyroid disease is Hashimoto's, but a lot of it is. A lot of this underactive thyroid, when you ask your doctor what caused it, you'll often just get a blank look and a a bit of a shrug but the fact is it's not working because it's been destroyed and almost certainly the cause of that destruction has been an autoimmune process where your body has attacked itself and we know that cutting out gluten is one strategy that will improve that to some extent the other element in the diet that appears to be also useful um, which interestingly it, it has some cross reactive autoimmune effects with gluten which basically means if you've got an autoimmune problem with gluten um you're almost certainly like uh, well you're very likely very possible to have an autoimmune reaction to this other substance and that is dairy and that's very unfortunate for people on low carbon ketogenic diets um, but certainly my recommendation if i diagnose a patient with an autoimmune thyroid disease if we 
if we measure your blood and find that you've got these antibodies circulating that are attacking your thyroid gland, I'll very often recommend eliminating gluten and eliminating dairy for a period of six months and see, then monitor your thyroid antibodies and see if we can actually dial down that immune attack. So let's just explore the gluten and the dairy a little bit uh, more. I mean, I always feel that you know, gluten, poor old gluten cops all the, you know, all the blame. And, uh, you know, I suspect the gluten is just part of the whole, uh, the whole picture. It's really just wheat, isn't it? I mean, that, that's the major culprit. And, and there's so many of us are, uh, uh, well, allergic or, 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 you know, that wheat is, is, is toxic, uh, to us and it, and it's gluten and a whole lot of other substances in, uh, within wheat. And this is almost certainly why ketogenic and low carb diets are so effective because they, Gluten-containing grains and wheat and these kind of things are very high in carbohydrate. So what's the first thing you cut out when you go on a low-carb diet? You cut out the bread. So almost certainly when we do these studies and we see our thyroid function is improving on ketogenic diets, um, it's not just going to be the carbs, but I do believe the carbs do play a very important role because there is an interaction between thyroid and insulin resistance. Um, but I they have no doubt at all that that eliminating of the wheat is a is a key factor just because wheat contains carbs you get rid of that that's a big supply it's got other bad stuff in there as well um besides gluten as you say things like wheat germaglutinin um which is a potent trigger of uh, a potent risk factor in susceptible individuals for other autoimmune issues as well the thing to understand about autoimmune disease is they're like pokemon so you've got grandkids, Peter, you, you may have heard about this. You know, I know they weren't there in the 1920s. but um, So once you get one, you've got to get them all. So what do I mean by that? I mean, misery loves company. So the single biggest risk factor for having one autoimmune issue is having another autoimmune issue. That's because the, the root cause of having one is very similar to another. When I said to you that people with celiac disease are very much more likely to have autoimmune thyroid disease that that goes for a bunch of other autoimmune diseases in actual fact in medical school we were taught uh, autoimmune clusters so we were taught that they 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 went together so tightly we often had constellations that it was almost mandatory for example if somebody was diagnosed with a, a celiac disease that you would also have to test for um, autoimmune diseases affecting B12 and of the thyroid and a, a bunch of other things as well. So uh, that, that's, a, that's a real big problem here. So almost certainly if you identify one autoimmune issue and you take steps to address that through diet, then if you get improvements in that area, then you're also very likely to have improvements in these other associated areas. Now, I'm glad you can remember what we were taught in medical school. It's way too long ago for me. Um, so just before we go off uh, off wheat, I mean, uh, people often sort of say, well, you know, we've been eating, uh, you know, wheat products, uh, bread and so on for, you know, for hundreds and, and thousands of years. Why, why suddenly now is wheat, does wheat seem to be so, uh, so, so sort of toxic to so many people? Well, I think there's really two main reasons as to why. So the first one, oh, actually three main reasons. So the first one is we have different cultivars of wheat. So the, the breeds of wheat we have now is not the same as it was before. Now, one of the natural defences that crops have against pests, you know, little insects that would eat them, are natural chemicals called lectins, and then, but they're essentially natural pesticides. Now, through modern breeding and engineering of wheat, we've been able to breed types of wheat products that actually need less herbicides and pesticides added to them because they actually produce produce it themselves more internally so they're, they're very the chemical composition of some of these potentially deleterious chemicals is much greater in a modern cultivar of wheat than it is in an ancient cultivar of wheat and i've got many patients who will say they can consume bread from an italy or you know where they've still got maybe more traditional farming techniques where in Australia we've mastered mass wheat production. So bread in Australia is, is very different. Another uh, problem is the processing. So modern bread processing may only ferment bread 
where you actually break down things like gluten and these other problematic chemicals for about an hour. Compare that to more traditional, um, say, sourdough, which is fermented for 72 hours, and you can begin to see that these industrialization processes, um, they actually change the nature of the food we eat. And the third massive factor is pesticides. So I'm sure you've heard of glyphosate. Now, glyphosate is a, an organo, organophosphate phosphate, um, pesticide that is used widely around the world. And I believe that farmers are allowed to spray this onto crops, onto wheat, three weeks before harvest in Australia. And they may often only do it for you know, reasons like trying to dry the crop out. So there have been some estimates that we've had you know, just a ridiculous increase in the last couple of decades, even a 500% increase exposure in the general population to these chemicals. And these chemicals actually indeed are detectable in our bodies. Um, so there's no doubt about it. And I'm sure you're aware of the lawsuit that I think Monsanto is currently facing in America and there's been some uh, some talk of some pretty hefty financial penalties. So th I think there's more to come out on this story. But in terms of you have to understand that, you know, if you grew up, you know, um, eating bread and it was fine and it was made with, you know, pre-industrial techniques, it was, you know, your mother might have baked it in the kitchen and it was done with these um, pre-GMO crops and it didn't have all this glyphosate sprayed on it, then that's a completely different beast to what we're consuming now. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and just to, just to touch, finish on the dairy side of things, um, when you say dairy, I mean, is, is there certain dairy products that tend to be more sort of allergenic or more uh, inclined to sort of cause these, these issues th than others? For instance, compare, you know, cream and, and milk and butter and, and yogurt. I mean, uh, you know, is yeah, that what yeah. you think? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's, there's very good evidence for that. In actual fact, there seems to be something about the fermentation process that makes dairy less problematic. Um, so yogurt can be a very good option, but there is a caveat. So if you go and buy your yogurt from the store and have a look at the ingredients, if you see that it's got milk, culture, and maybe a yeast or something and nothing else, then that's going to be a great yogurt. But if you look on the label and you see that they've also got added milk solids, so what they'll often do, they'll often ferment the dairy, which is great, and they, they sort of reduce the quantity of some of the problematic uh, components and then they'll just add a bunch of milk solid back in just for a bit of extra protein or fat or whatever it is they're aiming for so if you're worried about whether dairy might be provoking autoimmune issues and you say but I love it I'm not going to give it up I still have to have some dairy I'm going to have yogurt then there's a lot of nuance you check the label and make sure that you're not having a yogurt with added milk solids so I mean the the point is that the food we're having now that we buy is completely different to the food that our grandparents were consuming. Yep. Absolutely. Um, look, we want to leave time for questions, but just w one last thing. Just, I mean, you've obviously uh, had a lot of experience of managing thyroid issues with diet. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience with, with, with uh with managing the putting these patients onto a sort of a, a low carb, ketogenic, gluten free, dairy free, uh, what what sort of response is is sort of typical? Well, the first thing we look for is uh, the attack on the thyroid because I don't believe it's useful to improve the sensitivity of thyroid hormone if you're going to continue to destroy the thyroid gland and ultimately not have thyroid hormone at all. So I always have a large focus on that. And typically we do see a slow decline in thyroid antibodies. The thing about it is that it can be very frustrating because these antibodies can live in your blood for months and months and months. We know, for example, the antibodies against celiac disease that we can diagnose on a blood test, they can live for 15 months in the blood. So just because you changed your diet two months ago and you get another blood test, don't expect to see dramatic reduction. And don't get despondent if it hasn't dramatically reduced in a short period of time because these things have a long half-life. But 
And that's why I often use six monthly intervals to test the thyroid antibodies. I, I, I wouldn't really expect drastic reductions in shorter periods of time. But I do like to get visibility that we actually are, hopefully, and we often do, we usually do get some reduction in the thyroid antibodies. Number two, um, a lot of people will be on medication. And if we notice that their TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, is actually getting too low, then we do need to gradually reduce the amount of thyroid medication that people are taking. On the flip side of it, a lot of people that I do see come to me and they're, they just, their thyroid activity is underactive, it's underdone, and I will often recommend a modest increase in the, the thyroid hormone dosing or potentially some compounded bioidentical thyroid hormone. Um, but in general, the responses that we will see, we'll, we'll generally expect to see over time a reduced attack against the thyroid and would we'll often also observe an increased activity of the thyroid, especially on people who aren't on medications. We'll often see the TSH will come from a quite a borderline or equivocal level of two and a half or three, and I like to get it down to clearly below two. And that's pretty typical for a lot of patients. What about symptoms? I mean, what what effect does it have a, a dietary approach have on symptoms? All very well to say, okay, the blood tests improve, uh, your TSA, your antibodies reduced, your TSH uh, comes uh, comes down. Um, but uh, you know, that's fine. But uh, really, what what you know, our, yeah. uh, our I don't know, well, is people it, go to doctors because they feel lousy. So uh, a bit of a caveat here. So generally, people feel so much better. I quite honestly. Hand on my heart, every day people say, I just feel better, I'm sleeping well, I just feel great. And, and those patients, thank you. I mean, you make my day worth working. Um, but the question is, do we have visibility on exactly? Because as I said before, we're not, when we put people on these diets, we, we often fix more than one pathology. We're addressing insulin resistance. We're addressing high blood sugar levels. We might be addressing gut inflammation and celiac related issues as well as thyroid issues. So mm -hmm. the beautiful thing about a ketogenic or a healthy diet is that it addresses multiple pathologies at the same time. So can we necessarily attribute these improvements we have in patient well-being to thyroid pathology only? Uh, no, probably not. So in the patients who... I change if the only thing we do is to go from levothyroxine to a bioidentical thyroid hormone, then yes, I think that's fair enough. We can attribute any changes because that's the only thing we've changed in isolation. But when you do a nutritional intervention, um, we expect that you will feel better. Um, is it feeling better because you had these other diseases or is it feeling better purely because we've improved the thyroid disease? I don't have a great visibility on that, but I honestly don't think it matters no. so long as you feel better. Long as you, long as you feel better, that's uh, that's the main thing. There, that uh, yeah, that's that's good to hear. Um, I think you know, I think if, if we're giving sort of basic advice, really, I mean, uh, people say, well, you know, how ketogenic, how this, how that. I mean, it's really just avoiding processed and ultra processed food, isn't it? I mean, I think if we can, uh, you know, because a lot of these uh, these toxins that are that are going to affect, um, you know, auto uh, immune and, and so on are, are in, in processed food, so if we uh, if we just stick to, to real food, you know, to uh, to sticking to the outside of the supermarket, avoiding those uh, those middle aisles, then uh, then you know you're really doing yourself a huge favour. Couldn't agree more. All right, um, let's. Uh, I might hand back to Zoe, and uh, Zoe can uh, shoot the questions, and uh, I'll uh, I'll sit here and nod my head knowingly, and Paul can answer them. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, look, before we get stuck into the questions, and there's there's some goodies coming up, Paul, I think they're going to test your knowledge. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that until midnight on Tuesday, 18th of October, anyone who starts their free trial of the Defeat Diabetes program will also receive a complimentary copy of our e-cookbook, Fresh and Simple, some very good recipes in there, can highly recommend it. Um, so uh, don't forget to, to start your free trial as soon as possible. And also, so don't forget, you can now access the program online uh, as well as via the mobile app. Um, so you'll get all of that incredible content, videos, um, masterclasses, lessons with both Peter and Paul um, uh, delivered through your desktop PC as well as via the mobile app. 
Okay, so perhaps we'll now get into some of these questions. Um, so one of them is from a lady called Rita, and she asks, Paul, is there any evidence whether gluten is detrimental for Hashimoto's disease? Yes. So that, that condition that we talked about, that autoimmune attack against the thyroid, uh, that is actually, that study I referred to, that randomised control study, was actually in patients with Hashimoto's disease. Got it. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. And um, Rita also asked um, which sugar alternatives are best for IBS patients, i.e. which ones don't negatively impact the gut microbiome. Now, there's a lot of controversy around this, and I think <laughs> I look forward to this answer. <laughs> So here's the problem. So we've got two types of artificial sweeteners. So you've got what we call, so first of all, let's talk about IBS. So basically that stands for irritable bowel syndrome. It's completely different to inflammatory bowel disease. Now the symptoms in irritable bowel syndrome are caused by gas. So the volume of the entire gastrointestinal tract is only about a litre. So, and that's in, you know, you've got 10 metres of winding bowel. So you can imagine it doesn't take a large bubble of gas at any point in time to cause considerable discomfort or bloating symptoms. So where does that gas come from? So if you consume something that your body can't absorb into its body, then you've got bacteria in your intestines that will feed it for you. That's called putrefaction, rotting. And that's what fibre is, fibre rots. Now... If so, anything that your body doesn't absorb can be fermented, putrefied by bacteria, and they produce gas in the process. So that's where this gas comes from. Now, the way artificial sweeteners work, so one class of them is the, the sugar alcohols, um, the polyols, and they're, they're strongly associated with irritable bowel syndrome. And bacteria will just jump onto them and num, 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 thank you very much, they'll fart away, and you won't be feeling very happy. So, and you'll get some really odd symptoms. And I say odd symptoms because you'll get constipation and diarrhea. And you're probably going to think, well, hang on for a second, how on God's green earth is that possible? They're the opposite. So sometimes the gas they produce is methane and methane actually stops your intestines from contracting. It stops it from pushing things through. So if you're not pushing things through, you're going to get constipated. At the same time, there's something called an osmotic effect. This is the chemical tendency of fluid to be drawn to molecules. You've got these unabsorbed polyol molecules, what we call the sugar alcohols. And for reference, that'll be things like erythritol or xylitol, sorbitol. It ends in toll. Um, these molecules will actually draw fluid, which will give you liquid stool. So that will lead you to the sense that you really, you're feeling bloated. You can't really pass emotion. It's just hanging around because the methane is inhibiting the, the motion through your bowel. And when you finally do go, it will come out like liquid. So it's almost paradoxical. So the problem is uh, if we, uh, you, you, you've got those as an artificial sweetener option and they're all going to be terrible. If you pick up a low, an Atkins bar or a low-carb bar, a chocolate bar in the supermarket that's been artificially sweetened, and they all have, if you look hard enough in fine print, you'll see warning may have laxative effect. Um, you'll see that on the artificially sweetened lollies as well. Any artificially sweetened foods that uses this class of drug I believe is mandated that they provide a warning that it can have a laxative effect. You look at chewing gum, it also has the same thing. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the that class of artificial sweeteners, you've got IBS, stay away. Uh, and then you've got other artificial sweeteners, aspartame and things like that. And that's a whole nother story, very controversial. Uh, all I'll say on that for the moment is that I personally wouldn't take that. What about the natural, you know, you know, artificial sweeteners, so like stevia and so on, Paul? Are they less bad? Well, they they sort of seem to be. They don't produce as less bad. Yes, I think stevia is probably probably the pick of the bunch. To be fair. Okay. Okay, we uh, have another question from Yvonne Vaughn. Uh, she was wondering if being hypo will bring on tendonitis. So 
this is a case of correlation and causation. So, so what we're seeing is that uh, two things happen at the same time. So people with thyroid disease will frequently have tendon pain. People with diabetes will frequently have tendon pain. People with celiac disease will often have tendon pain, joint pain. So the question is, what's causing what? So there are some theoretical mechanisms how an underactive thyroid can weaken your connective tissues. We certainly know if we have a look at bone and just understand that bone is basically just a mineralized tendon. It's very, you can think of it as being a calcified tendon. We know that having an underactive thyroid because it affects your ability to maintain the tissues of the body, it leads to osteoporosis, um, that weak bone disease. So certainly... Um, having an underactive thyroid gland does lead to an... In, it basically means that the, the mechanical load that your tendon can sustain before it breaks down is much less. So if you're doing a lot of stair walking or something like that, you'll, you'll be able, you won't be able to do as many flights of stairs a day before you'll start to get that kind of overuse injury. So certainly that is true. An underactive thyroid will place you at increased risk of tendon injury through that mechanism. But also the associated things, if you've got an underactive thyroid, you're more likely to have these other inflammatory conditions and they too can cause tendon pain. And it's sometimes very difficult to tease that apart. In actual fact, that's my day job as a sports medicine physician. Um, that's where my training is actually in terms of trying to diagnose the nuances of problems like tendon pains and joint pains. And it, it can be very difficult to tease apart. And, you know, inflammation is is the underlying issue in a lot of these uh, these conditions. Obviously, in in tendon pain and, and a lot of these uh, chronic diseases and so on. So it's not surprising that uh, that uh, you know tendon pain is uh, is common with these diseases. I mean, I, I know personally, I had a long history of Achilles pain. Every morning, you'd sort of wake up and you'd be you'd be sore as you put, take your first step out of out of bed. And I remember, you know, three months into my uh, my my diet you know, suddenly realising that, hey, I don't have my tendon pain anymore. And uh, so, and I, I'm assuming that was because of, I was basically an, on an anti-inflammatory diet. We know that processed foods and, and particular sugars and, and seed oils are inflammatory. And if we remove them from our diet, we re reduce the inflammation throughout our body. And so we have uh, multiple uh, positive effects such as uh, you reduce tendon pain and so on. Zoe, what do you got for us? Uh, and so you kind of answered uh, this question, I think, in a, a little a little bit, but we'll just cover it off. So um, Dal Rupal has asked, once Hashimoto's hyperthyroidism is di diagnosed, does diet help? And um, Yvonne Craswell has also said, what's the best eating plan for people with no thyroid with type 2 diabetes? All right, so once the Defeat Diabetes Program would uh, be a pretty good start, I reckon. <laughs> So once diagnosed, does it help? I mean, yes. So if I can go back to something we haven't talked about in a while, um, insulin resistance. So the concept of resistance to a hormone, insulin resistance, means that this hormone's got a job to do in the body. It's just not working very effectively. It's, uh, it can be thought of as the, you know, the 1970s, you know, doc union worker. It's just not doing a lot. Um, but once we go on a healthy diet, we know that insulin does its job properly. And thyroid hormone is the same. So even if you have an underactive thyroid, that it's not releasing as much hormone as it ought, going on a healthy diet will make whatever you are releasing do a better job. Yeah, it's a good summary. Okay. Um, somebody has asked the question, uh, the I think it's probably a good one for us to answer, and that is that the webinar's title is Thyroid Dysfunction and Type 2 Diabetes, but they're keen to understand a little bit more what is the link between the two. Basically metabolism. So as you understand that when you have high insulin levels and insulin resistance, your metabolic rate is significantly impaired. When your thyroid is underactive, your metabolic rate is significantly impaired. They basically will often lead to the same symptoms. And part of that, I believe, is that they often have the same cause. We certainly know that uh, 
when you have diabetes, one of the best predictors of you dropping dead of a heart attack is having high triglyceride levels. And we know that diabetes causes an increase in your triglyceride levels. Well, through very similar mechanisms, an underactive thyroid also does the exact same thing. The problem is it, it's really like a gruesome twosome, um, diabetes and thyroid disease together. Uh, they're, they're commonly present and they work on very similar pathways and they make each other worse. And very similar symptoms in many ways. I mean, I think fatigue is a really you know, major, it's obviously probably the major symptom in, in thyroid disease and it's a huge issue in, uh, in diabetes as well. Fortunately, diet that helps one will help the other. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for just maybe one or two more questions. Um, Paul Gay asks, um, she's been following this eating plan for three months. She's lost 12 kilos, or done gay, um, and she's seeing a GP Friday for her blood results. But her concern is that this last week she's been suffering from terrible cramps at night. Please help. What should she do? Okay, so we're not going to talk about Gay's situation, but we may talk about a hypothetical situation of, uh, of uh, somebody's cousin who has leg cramps at night. So if I had that kind of patient, uh, there's a couple of things. So everybody knows about magnesium and potassium and all of that, so fine. I believe one of the most common overlooked causes of nocturnal, meaning nighttime cramping, is actually iron deficiency. So this is what I notice in a lot of my patients, especially my female patients. Now, iron is actually essential for your muscles to burn energy, to generate something called ATP. Now, what most people may not realise is that when a muscle contracts, you're not actually using energy. The energy is used, the ATP is used when the muscle relaxes. So what happens is frequently in the early stages, and that explains why you get rigor mortis, you know, when somebody dies and their body goes stiff for a while, that's because they've run out of energy and everything stiffens up. They don't have the energy available for their, for their muscles to relax. That's the, the underlying physio pathophysiology of rigor mortis. So if you have something like an iron deficiency, that actually impairs your ability to generate this energy, this energy currency called ATP, and an impaired supply of energy impairs your ability to relax a muscle. And I think that's what a lot of doctors overlook in terms of what a cramp is, it, fundamentally, a cramp is a problem of energy provision. And iron deficiency is a, a very common cause of that. Now, having said that, iron deficiency is not straightforward to diagnose because we'll often uh, look at what we call ferritin stores, which is the stored version of iron in your blood, and we'll say, well, if that's really low, then, well, you're clearly iron deficient. We'll give you some. The problem is the threshold they use to diagnose whether you're iron deficient is, I believe, unreasonably low. They, they, they make you clear an excessively high bar before they'll say, okay, you're iron deficient. And the other problem is you can have a condition called functional iron deficiency where if you're inflamed, we come back to this one again, Peter, if you're inflamed, the body will take all the iron out of your blood and stuff it into your storage. So it won't be available for your body to use. So it's what we call a functional iron deficiency. But because it's being stuffed into storage, your stores go up. And the doctor will look at them and say, no, you don't have low iron, you've got high iron. In actual fact, it's, it's not a problem of absolute iron deficiency, it's a problem of inflammation. And the only way that you'll ever solve that, this functional iron deficiency, is by addressing the inflammation. Having said that, don't ignore magnesium, potassium. Oh, well, so, sure. you know, they're all uh, potential causes of, uh, of, of cramps. Uh, and I'd all certainly be. Very simple, easy, first line things to try. But the fact is that by the time people come to see me, uh, they've usually drank a black sea's worth of magnesium electrolyte drinks. 
Okay, well, um, apologies for the late start, but that is about all we have time for today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Paul, for another enlightening talk. Um, for those who are watching at home, don't forget that we have that special offer on for anybody who starts their free trial of Defeat Diabetes uh, before midnight on Tuesday, 18th of October. You'll get a free, fresh and simple e-cookbook with lots of yummy recipes in there. So um, head on over to Defeat Diabetes com.au and start your free no risk trial today and also don't forget that the digital program is now available online as well as being available via the mobile app thank you everybody for watching we'll see you again soon see ya <laughs>